Good morning. Will you rise as you're able this morning and join us in singing our opening song, This Is The Day. invite you to join together in the spirit of prayer on this incredible day that our God has made. Heavenly Creator, most merciful and gracious God, we give you thanks for gathering us here into this incredible community, for inspiring us with words and song and joy and celebration. We ask that you continue to warm our hearts as you have warmed this day, that we may truly be your arms thrown open to heal a hurting world. We ask all these things in your many names. Amen. Welcome. Welcome to worship at Founders Metropolitan Community Church. Do we have any first-time visitors today? First-time visitors. If you're here, we say thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Our, our ushers have some flowers and a little bit of information about our community. And we invite you and everybody following our closing song to stop down in Fellowship Hall to join us where we have some snacks and coffee so that we may be community not just in and at worship, but after worship as well. To everybody who's joined us online, I do say welcome to you as well. It is always a blessing to know as we worship here that we are joined by people around the world. And so thank you for tuning in. I do encourage you at some point during this broadcast to scroll down to the bottom of the screen where you're watching the broadcast and you'll find that there's a place where you can enter in a little information about yourself, share with us your prayer requests. Let us know how we can continue to be supportive of you wherever you are on your life or spiritual journey. Thank you for tuning in and worshiping with us as always. And to everybody who's here, thank you for coming out on this incredibly gorgeous, beautiful, wonderful, warm day. <laughs> we are celebrating today, and so today we're going to have some fun. We're singing some camp songs. Um, our theme today is church camp, and we're just going to wonder about that great mystery. And especially for those of you who are in the back, maybe when you come up for communion or at some point, I encourage you to take a peek over um, here in the corner by, um, by where Garrett is on, on guitar, because guitar, um, you'll notice that we have this little fire that's going. And, um, and so it is, it is celebratory. Um, if you have some marshmallows, you're welcome to come on, come on forward. 
but, uh, but just uh, we're going to have fun today. So in the spirit of having that kind of fun, I do encourage you to rise as you're able to greet those who are near you, to let them know that they are in the right place this morning. first reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 3, beginning in the seventh verse. Then Yahweh said, The cry of the children of Israel has reached me, and I have watched how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now go, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. God answered, I will be with you, and this is a sign by which you will know that it is I who have sent you. After you bring my people out of Egypt, you will all worship at this very mountain. But, Moses said, when I go to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, if they ask me, What is this God's name? What am I to tell them? God replied, I am as I am. This is what you will tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. rise as you are able for the second reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, beginning in the 27th verse. Notice how the flowers grow. They neither labor nor weave. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was robed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass in the field, which are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, How much more will God look after you? You have so little faith. As for you, don't set your hearts on what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Stop worrying. All the nations of the world seek these things. Yet your Abba God knows well what you need. Set your sights on the kingdom of God. And all these other things will be given to you as well. Fear not, little flock, for it has pleased your Abba to give you the kingdom. Hear what the Spirit says today. Sing alleluia to our God.
Please be seated. So I want you to imagine. Imagine for a moment that you were meant to be here this morning. Not because of the reasons that you thought of when you rolled out of bed and decided that you would actually make your way here, but because you are part of a bigger picture, a bigger reason. There's something amazing, miraculous that is going to happen right here because you are here in this place today. Uh, Imagine for a moment that this is right where you're supposed to be, on this day, on this place, wherever you are, on your journey. Imagine that here in this place, the people that we have been gathered with, that all of those challenging questions, the big questions of life, that those answers to things like, what do I believe and who am I and what am I to do, that the answers to those questions are to be found as we come together Explore them together and face the challenges because we are together, come what may. Just imagine. Now, many of you may know that years and years and years ago, I used to spend, I used to volunteer a couple of weeks every year at church camp. We would gather together, and I first started off as a camp counselor, and there would be camps that would be organized by age groups. There was camps for the fourth and fifth graders, there was a camp for the sixth graders, one for the seventh and eighth graders, and another for the high schoolers. And during the same week, five or six of these camps would be running concurrently in this wonderful, beautiful 900-acre camp in the rural woods of Northwest Connecticut. Eventually, I moved from counselor to program co-leader, and we would gather for a long weekend retreat, not around some campfire, but more like around some sort of internal fireplace in the middle of a Connecticut winter in some cold, cold January weekend. We'd all be there, everybody who would lead these camps, as well as some of the church staff. And we'd do our detailed planning, we'd try to coordinate when were we going to go and do arts and crafts and take the kids down for a dip in the lake and work through the the, the different components of our programming. One year, following a particularly challenging summer, the camp director gathered us in front of the fire and as we listened and watched the crackling, he asked us, to go around that circle and to share what it was that made the camp so special. Why did we spend hours and hours and hours of our life throughout the year making plans for these programs? And then why would, it, why would we volunteer a week, 24 hours a day for a whole week in order to lead these camps and guide these kids? And we heard stories, lots and lots of stories. Stories about love and connection and community and how important it was to give back. And occasionally, choking back tears, one or another of us would share a brief story about a young life that seemed to be touched and transformed and changed, not just in that moment, but in some deeper sense, feeling like the changes that we experienced there would last that young person a lifetime. He then asked us, he asked us to imagine what would it be like if the week that we shared together across all these different age groups, all these different camps with our different programs and our different plans, if if those weeks felt more like the beloved community that Jesus spoke about that kingdom of God where love actually reigns and rules, rather than the competitive, divisive outside world for which that camp was supposed to be a retreat. What would it take if it looked like that, he asked. 
And then he sent us off into groups of five or six or seven of us by week so that we could actually think about how do we actually make that happen? How during our week, during that summer, might we glimpse the kingdom for a moment? What plans might we make in order to try to knit these different age groups together? We struggled. We questioned. We didn't quite understand what it was that he meant. We created a few plans, but most of all, we shared our worries. And you know, I think that this is what Jesus is up to that day when he speaks to the disciples. He's not just talking to the disciples when he says, don't worry. He's actually talking to crowds of thousands, we're told. Thousands have gathered. And at first, he shares things that we need to watch out for. He tells us not to say one thing and act another way, not to just perform because people are watching and then in the darkness lie or do things that are completely the opposite of this way of love that we've been taught we're supposed to live. He then goes on and he tells this parable and he talks about um, the importance of us spending time to develop relationships and to follow the way of our hearts and our deeper connection rather than depending upon all of the stuff that we might want to surround our lives. He tells the parable about the rich young man who gathers up all that he could ever hope for or imagine only to die and have it all lost and go away. And then, and then he turns to the disciples and he says, if your God is so great to worry enough for a small little sparrow, if your God is so considerate to make sure that the lilies of the field have exactly what they need, think about how much more important you are. Think about this, that your God loves you so much You don't need to worry about what you'll have. Seek first. Seek first, he says. Seek first this kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the place where God's love reigns and rules, and everything else in your life will fall into place. The most important thing is for you to live this vision of love, knowing that you have everything that you already need in order to be God's loving presence in this world world. Seek that first, and everything else will fall in place. And so we're gathered there, and pretty quickly that weekend retreat ends, and we've got a couple of plans, and we're going to do, I don't know, some sort of a treasure hunt, and the older children will read stories to the younger children. And we go on promising that we're going to think a little bit more about this vision that the camp director has set before us. But life interrupts and things go on. And before we know it, the weekend of our appointed time has arrived. And it's now Sunday afternoon, and I'm seated at a picnic table waiting to register all of the children who have signed up to come to my camp. And right Beside me is my friend. She actually is a school teacher, and she leads the the camp for the fourth and the fifth graders. It's a Garfield-themed camp, and she's there, and she's got her bright orange T-shirt on and her sunglasses, and she's got a hat that says Garfield on it in case anybody missed it. And then, to make sure people knew exactly where they had to go to sign up, she has, I kid you not, two dozen, 24 Garfields of all different shapes and sizes, poses and dress, stacked up on her half of this picnic table. (laughs) Between registrations, we chit-chat and just catch up about what's going on in our life and what our plans are for this week that, that lies before us. And there's about an hour left to go, and all of a sudden, a car pulls up, and she sees it. And before it even stops, like the doors fly open, and these two young girls bound out, screaming her name, and having Garfields that they're tagging and, and carrying in tow. And she says, oh, she says, those, those are the twins. They're my last two registration. And she quickly packs up her stuff. She grabs her clip, clipboard, and she moves over to meet these two girls. And with like a single breath in one long run-on sentence, the two of them chime in, asking her a million questions all at the same time and trying to catch her up on everything that has happened in the year that has transpired since she last saw them. I lost my last tooth. We went to Canada. Grammy got a new car. And our, when are we going to the beach? And when is art class? And is Chip here? And on and on and on they go. And in 
appropriate school teacher manner, she smiles, she nods, she acknowledges them, and then she addresses the parents. And she carries them away and takes them down and guides them off onto her camp. The remaining hour, I finish registering the rest of the kids who are part of my camp, and I start to pack things up when I notice that Lynn has left behind this crate of her 24 Garfields. <laughs> Being the good guy that I am, I decide that I'm going to take possession of these and I will return them at the appropriate time. And so I throw my papers on top, I take them to my cabin, I have barely enough time to gather the camp to do some icebreakers, introductions, and then it's time for opening assembly, and then we move immediately on to dinner in the church hall, in the camp hall. Well, we say grace, we sing some songs, we pass the bread, the room is like just filled to the brim with all of this chatter of new friends being made. When all of a sudden, Lynn, in this overly dramatic style, rises up from her table and bounds across the room so everybody sees what's going on, and she grabs the microphone, and she says, excuse me, excuse me, and everybody quiets down immediately to find out what's going on. She says, I, I need your help. I, I just found out that late this afternoon, a whole group of Garfields, 24 Garfields, have gone missing. This dramatic hush moves through the whole dining hall. And the kids at the Garfield tables, like their eyes open big and wide. Like, how could this happen and how could this be? And Lynn, she starts moving around in this great improvisation, like just going with the moment. She goes to the table where the seventh graders are sitting, and she's like, can you help me? Have you seen them? And then she moves on to the eighth grade table. Will, will you join? Will you help us find the Garfields? And this poor young lady in seventh or eighth grade is staring up at the school teacher, not quite sure, like, how to respond. Like, who am I? I just arrived at this camp, and what am I supposed to do, and how can I help you? Who am I? She wonders. I have to imagine that that's what Moses must have felt like on that day. There's this burning bush, and God somehow arrives and tells him this amazing vision. Like, like you dude, you're the one. You're going to go and you're going to help to set my people free. I've heard their cries. I've listened to the children. And, and you're the one. And Moses is like, like, me? Like, who am I? Who am I? At that moment, I have to imagine that what Mo is going through Moses' hand, head is that he's probably counting off and listing on his hand all of the reasons why he probably shouldn't be in that place or at that time. And if God really knew who he was, God probably wouldn't be knocking on his door. Moses is a fugitive. He's running away because he broke the law. Not only did he break the law, he took somebody's life. He's hiding out. He doesn't speak very well. He's not that articulate. He's a poor little old shepherd. One might say he's an immigrant or a refugee, a stranger in a strange land. And there is God knocking on his door saying, I need you to go to the most powerful person of the greatest nation at that point that had ever existed on the history of this planet. And I need you to be the one who's going to go and tell Pharaoh to set my people free. <laughs> and he's like, I'd be like, like that seventh or eighth grader I have to imagine is like, who am I? Like, no, seriously, who am I? How's this going to happen? I want to know how. I want my guarantees. Like, like, give me my certainties. Like, what's the next step? How's this going to happen? And God does the amazing thing. I love this story because look at God's response to him. Who am I, Moses says. Every time that you're tempted to say, who am I? I have nothing. I can't do this. I can't make this happen. It's too big a problem. It's too difficult for me to actually make this happen. Who am I, Moses says. And what is God's response? I will be with you. Who am I? I'm the person that God will be with. How does that change your perspective on life? Who am I? Not only that, this is the way that God's vision works. I'm convinced of this. This is the way God's vision works. God says, I will be with you. You will go and you will talk to Pharaoh. You will set my people free. And you will know this is true because y'all are going to show up on this mountain where you're going to worship God. This vision is going to be true because you believe this vision so much that you're going to go and do this impossible thing. And trust me, I'll be with you. So, so the vision 
God's vision, God's vision for your life, God's hope for this community, God's hope for the world is so big that it becomes real when it lives alive in our hearts, in our minds so much, we start to organize ourselves around it. All of our worry, all of our fear falls away. Who am I? You're the person that God is with. And so Lynn is there in this dining room hall, and she's like doing this great drama, this dramatic thing, and she has engaged all of us in this search for the missing Garfields. Well, time goes by, dinner ends, and I'm like tempted to go and race back and grab this case of Garfields and just deposit them back in her camp so all is well and all is forgotten. When all of a sudden a note is slipped to me by one of the church staff that just simply reads, Lynn believes that you may know who it is who has the Garfields. (laughs) Maybe, maybe not. (laughs) She only needs three returned. And then she describes the three. I'll pass the word around and see what I can do, I say. Well, one thing leads to another, and eventually these three Garfields are placed in the custody of one of the camp staff people. And I think nothing of it. And I go on, we have camp, and and the next morning at breakfast time, we're all sitting there, and the cereal has come out, and the milk is being passed out, when one of the young girls at my table starts to giggle and laugh, and I can't figure out what's so funny. And she turns this milk carton, every single one of the milk cartons in the dining room hall that's being passed out to all of these different tables has now been decorated. One whole side of it has, in the script of a fourth or fifth grader written, missing (laughs) with beautifully hand-drawn, very creative Garfields, all in orange, of course. And at the bottom, at the bottom, if found, call 1-800-LOST-SHEEP. We all giggle, and, 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 and the kids at my table, they start to talk about this, and they speculate, and they wonder, like, where they may have gone, and whether Lynn actually knows what's going on, and where might they be? And one of the kids turns to the other and says, you know, I saw them at registration, and so did I, so I wonder when and how they go missing. Well, the chatter is going around the room, and all of a sudden, it comes to a, a wave of silence. And we look to see what's going on. And there, there are three children seated at the Garfield table. And they're all sitting, and they're pointing up at this this decorative balcony that sits right above the tray return. And we all start to look and follow their gaze. And what we all see, to our amazement, is that those three little Garfields have found their way back. And they're sitting there, and there's this cereal bowl with a spoon in front of one, and another is holding the milk carton, and they have been po- posed just so. And, and one of the church camp uh, staff, he goes and he grabs a ladder, which conveniently just happens to be nearby, and he climbs up, and he rescues these, these three, and he brings them down, and he sets them on the table ever so gently in front of the Garfield camp. And this young little little lady, you know, four year, four, fourth or fifth grade, she rises up and she gives him like this big bear hug and she screams out, my hero. <laughs> from that point forward, from that point forward, Garfields begin to appear one by one and two by twos. They, they show up sometimes at dinner time and sometimes at worship and once in a while even occasionally sunning themselves down on the beach. <laughs> Polaroid instant cameras or pictures are taken and passed on so everybody knows that they're still alive and all is well. And the entire camp is fully enthralled and goes through the week with eyes wide open, anticipating and expecting that around any corner and at any time, we might just gaze and we may see one of those lost little Garfields. By the end of the week, all the Garfields somehow have found their way back. And as we sit and we reflect upon the week, the church camp director, he says to all of us, the program leaders, he says, 
Well, I don't know, but this is more than I had ever imagined. Like, I don't know what it took to plan this kind of a week, but in 30 years of doing this week after week over the summer, there has never been this kind of an experience or a week at this camp. It was like we were that one community, the beloved community, all together trying to serve this one purpose. It was the vision that I put before you, but I didn't understand how it would come to be. And Lynn looks at him and says, well, don't look at me. She says, when I arrived, I was actually really, really tired. She confesses to the group of us. She says, actually, I thought this was going to be my last week doing summer camp because I was just exhausted. There was no more interest for me. It didn't, it had kind of lost its magic. She said, not anymore. Something happened during this week. Well, eventually she turned to me and I just simply said, I don't know. I just think that it may have been the results of the playful spirit. This is how God's vision works. It is so big, it can't be contained. It is so awesome and audacious, we couldn't even begin to imagine it. It lies somewhere over the horizon, and it exists and it lives because it lives within our hearts and within our minds and within our imaginations. And it comes alive when we share it, and together we decide that we're going to go see what lies over that hill. It's the way that this community is meant to be. It is what the vision that God has for each of us is supposed to be. Because together, when we share that vision, when we commit to follow and seek and try to actually be this beloved community, it becomes more than all of our worries. It becomes more than all of our fears. We don't need to worry about what's the steps in order to get there. We only need to worry about whether or not, in this moment, we are continuing to seek and open to, listen to, the spirit that lives in us and through us. I believe that that's the hope for the community. I believe that that's why we've been gathered here today, and I believe that this is the vision that we continue to seek. May God bless us on this journey. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, all over this land. I'd hammer a hammer, I'd hammer a morning, I'd hammer a 
Please be seated. Please be seated. To those of us who are joining us online, again, welcome, and it is always a joy to know that you're with us when we worship. In a few minutes, we're going to be celebrating communion, and communion at the Metropolitan Community Church, here as everywhere, is an open communion, which means you don't need to belong to this church or any church. You just need to desire a closer relationship with your Creator. And so we encourage you at this moment to go and gather up the wine, the juice, the crackers, the bread, whatever it is that you have that is available that you would like to use to celebrate this feast so that when we celebrate it, we can all join together in this one meal. For all of you who are here, I do encourage you um, to uh, take your newsletter. Um, your worship bulletin does double as a newsletter, and so I do encourage you to take that. There's a lot of things that are happening, especially as we move into July and August, and we're already starting to plan stuff for September. So keep an eye on your newsletter. Also, if you're not currently signed up for electronic newsletter, as the welcome pads go through, make sure that you give us your email and write very clearly. We'll get you added to our electronic newsletter so that you can stay abreast of what's happening even if you're, you're not able to make it one Sunday. I'd like to highlight a couple of things. Immediately following our worship service today, there is a lot of things that are happening. In the chapel, we have a prayer vigil where people are, are, are um, opening up to God's spirit and wondering um, what it is that God is calling us to be and do. In the hunter room, which is the uh, conference room just off of the courtyard, the social justice team is going to be having a meeting there. And downstairs in the fellowship theater, which is below the social hall, we have a special presentation and it's um, brought to us. It's free. It's open to everybody. It is a, a presentation about financial management 101. It's really about your personal finances. Um, how do you do budgeting? How do you manage cash flow when there's not that much cash that's flowing? And um, any other questions that you may have, it is brought to us by people who are members of the community um, and um, they are offering it to us because they really want us to be able to um, have the knowledge and the ability to uh, um, manage our, our personal well-being. Um, so your financial well-being is also helpful um, for your overall health. Um, and I know that a lot of people stress in these times. Um, about how do we make ends meet, and they have some ideas and suggestions for you. So wherever you are, I do encourage you to pick one of those events and stop on by. We also will have coffee and snacks in the um, fellowship hall as well. A couple of other things to be aware of. On July 22nd, that's just a couple of Saturdays from now, um, we're going to be uh, uh, premiering some interviews. This is part of our history. Um, the archives team has pulled together some interviews um, from many people who go all the way back to the beginning of this congregation, this movement, some of which have already passed on. And so they invite you to come on out and check that out. That's at 5 p.m. on July 22nd. Um, next Sunday at the 9 and the 11 o'clock worship service, we are really excited because out athlete um, Carrie Boyat is going to be coming and she's going to be offering the message at both the 9 and the 11 o'clock worship service. For those of you who don't know her story, um, her, the title of her message is How Big Is Your Brave? And um, she is somebody who had a promising career that ended abruptly when um, she experienced a hate crime in West Hollywood. And she tells the story about how she moved from initially having all that anger and feeling victimized to actually using that as a catalyst for inspiration. Um, so we really encourage you to come and check that out. She'll be at both the 9 and the 11 next Sunday. And then on July 28th, that's the last Friday, um, we are holding a fundraiser. It's a play. It will be downstairs in the Founders Theater. And um, all of the money, 100% of the proceeds that go for the ticket sales and the concessions will go to help all of our ministries here at Founders MCC. Um, it is called Bits of Paradise. It is a play which tells the story in their own words of young Sunday school children who were in the, um, the Japanese internment camps during World War II here in California and how they wrote letters and received letters um, to American GIs. And it's really a strong story about that relationship. So we encourage you to come and check that out. And if you want, um, Roger Owens, who's on the board, is helping to organize that. A lot of other things that are happening. I can't highlight them all. There's a table outside. Um, we are going to be participating in Downtown Pride um, the end of August, so see Patrick for that as well. We ask that you give, um, give as you are able. Give as God is blessing you. Give so that we can have the resources that are needed in order for us to do this incredible mission um, and live into the vision that God is placing on our hearts. Thank you.
We're so blessed in what we've received. So for the chance to be able to just demonstrate how grateful we are, we thank you. And we would ask that like the loaves and the fishes, these gifts would be multiplied in endless ways to touch the hearts and lives of all those who are destined to be drawn to you. Amen. During this time of community prayer, I invite you to take a deep breath and to turn inward to that quiet place that each of us possesses where we know God and whatever image most nurtures us is waiting for us, arms wide open, ready to hold us close, draw us near. And with that we say, beloved God, dear friend, we're so blessed and grateful to be able to gather here this morning as a church, as your church, your special, unique <coughs> facet of what it means to be a child and children of God. And so first, we just want you to hear that, that gratitude in our voice, feel the energy of, of thankfulness that emanates from us to you. And God, we would pray that we would always feel so grateful, that we would always be able to recognize and see all of the ways that you continue to make sure we're fed and clothed, all the ways that you continue to bless us and nurture us as your people. And yet, God, at the same time, we have to just recognize and acknowledge <clears throat> not everybody sees things the way that we do, and there's a lot of sorrow and heartache in this world, a lot of brokenness and woundedness, a lot of divisiveness and war, a lot of threat and fear and worry. And truthfully, God, even though we know that with you all things are possible sometimes we just feel hopeless and helpless and we just don't know what to do about any of that so we're going to turn that over to you God we'll continue to do our part as small and insignificant as it sometimes feels and we're just going to trust that that's enough and sort of again like the loaves and fishes you'll take our our small and meager efforts and somehow miraculously transform them into something that at the end of the day is much more significant and God, if we bring that in even closer, we have to look at our own country and how maybe for the first time or for the second time in the history of this short country, we're on the brink of a civil war of sorts, different ideologies that just can't seem to find common ground and it seems to be getting worse every day. And if we're really honest, God, even, even though we know that you see each of us and all of us the same way that sometimes we just feel we're superior or that we've got the right answer and sometimes we're as guilty as the next of refusing to listen to those who we disagree with and who disagree with us. So help us in that way, God. Help us to see particularly those who challenge us, those who we perceive to be the enemy. Help us to see them like you do. And in that sight, help us to be able to listen to them without judgment, even if we strongly disagree. And maybe, just maybe, in our willingness to just take them as they are, a little bit of healing can start. And lastly, God, each of us has our own personal needs, some more compelling than others. And so in, in the quiet of our hearts, God, right now, we just offer those up to you. Some of us are scared, some of us are lonely, some of us have big financial difficulties, some of us have health concerns, some of us may even be facing that brink of death. So God, we would ask for your help with all of these things and, and to strengthen our faith that you are there for us even during our darkest hours, during those times where we feel like there's nobody we can turn to. But we're going to bring this prayer once again, God, back to thanks. And just thank you for all the ways that you've looked after us, for all the ways we know you're going to continue to look after us. And we offer it to you with great love and celebration. In the name of our friend and teacher, Jesus, amen. I don't know about you, but um, the Jesus of my youth I wanted nothing to do with. He was taught to me to be this perfect human being. I was taught that he was both human and, and not human, but, but, but as a human being, he was perfect. And that just made me feel so imperfect. 
And so every time I heard another Jesus story, it made me feel worse and worse and worse about myself. And so it was like, this was not a guy I wanted to hang out with. Certainly didn't want to be his friend. Um, as I got older and really started to look at the life of this man, I started to see his humanness. And now I never feel closer to Jesus than when I read those stories and, and experience those times when he is really fully in his humanness. You know, when he's so frustrated with the people that are following him, he finally gets so pissed off, he gets in a rowboat and rows out to the middle of the lake just to get away from them, only to have them scramble around to the other side, and he's just really exasperated. Or when, you know, this one young woman has to take him to task for ignoring her and tells him, look, you even look, look after the dogs better than you're looking after me right now. And he has to acknowledge she's right. That doesn't sound too perfect to me. But I really like Jesus in, in the context of the story, of the communion story, the Last Supper story, because um, I work with grieving people all the time. I'm a grief counselor. And one of the things I've learned is that when we know our time is coming near, we're desperate to leave something behind for those we care about. And at the same time, we're so afraid we're going to be forgotten. This is why we erect big monuments. This is why people donate their, their vast estates to have buildings named in their honor. I hate to tell you, maybe it's a little bit about the building and what good is going to come out of it, but it's mainly it's because they want to make sure they're remembered years from now. That's the truth. What I like about this story is Jesus did both in one fell swoop. He knew that once he left, there would be heartache and sorrow and people might feel abandoned so he created a beautiful beautiful ritual that he knew at minimum once a year if not more often this was going to come to pass because he did it during a Passover Seder and it was pretty much a given that you were going to go to Seder you know uh, if you did nothing else you went to Seder so you went to church at least once a year um, so he left him this beautiful ritual to help them feel connected to him once again. But then, but then what did he say? He said, when you do this, remember me. And I'd like to think that in his humanness, for a split second, Jesus was afraid that despite everything he did, and everything he believed, and everything he taught them, he was afraid it wasn't enough. And that when he was gone, people would forget about him. And so as the story goes, he took the bread, and he blessed it, gave thanks and broke it and he said to them something quite mysterious he said this is my body which has been broken for you take this and eat and as often as you do it remember he was hoping they would he knew that they'd be able to do this again as often as you do this remember me and then he did what I think is the most astonishing thing of the whole meal he took this cup most scholars believe it was the cup of Elijah that nobody was supposed to touch during the Seder. It was set there sort of ritualistically with the belief that, you know, the prophet would return one day and you would know the prophet had come back because the wine would have been consumed at least a bit. But he picked it right up. And then he blessed it and he gave thanks. And then he offered it to his followers and said, this is my blood which will be shed for you and for many and as often as you drink this, remember me and I what's so astonishing about this to me is he didn't drink it he gave it to them to drink and to me that's the clearest message that he was letting them know you're the prophet it's up to you and he's saying that to us today it's up to us beloved God we would ask that in the moment of this ritual this sacred sacred ritual that's you gave us just to draw us closer to our teacher that you would allow these elements these simple elements to be transformed into whatever each of us needs to be so that we feel both close to Jesus and we're able to remember him in ways that just inspire us to further his work and his ministry in the world amen in order to prepare for this beloved ritual, I'm going to ask now that the ushers and the acolytes and the servers come forward at this time. And for those of you who are guests today, 
We really want you to know that here at Founders MCC, and this is the truth among MCCs all over the world, we celebrate an open communion, which is really quite remarkable when you think about it, because it means that, unlike a lot of other places, here you don't have to be a member of this church, you don't have to be a member of any other church to actually receive these elements, receive these gifts, and receive the blessing that comes with them. You're welcome just exactly as you are, even if you, like I was when I walked into this building or our building a quarter of a century ago, really doubtful about all of this, wasn't sure what I believed, I was still welcome. And so you're welcome today. Just please follow the directions of the ushers.
My friends, as we prepare to head out into the world, may we remember our worship has ended, but it is time for our service to begin. We have everything we need in order to be God's loving presence in our community, our city, and our world. And so as you head out into the world, may you go out with eyes wide open, expecting the unexpected, that spirit may lead you and guide you, and we find ourselves swept up in the mystery of God's love. I invite you now to rise as you're able for our closing song.